Hi, everyone, and welcome to another five minutes of British literature to go with this week's reading. Let's talk about Britain's culture of commerce and the new middle classes. England's progress as a nation may have looked dicey during the Civil Wars and the Restoration, but the dawn of the 18th century brought some exciting changes to the country's social and economic power structures. The Act of Union formally united the English and Scottish thrones into one kingdom of Great Britain. The Royal Society of London offered British scientists a way to network with each other, to distribute their work, and to set standards for proper scientific inquiry. The coal mines and the steam engine revolutionized British manufacturing and paved the way for the mass production of cheap goods. The expensive colonial projects of the 17th century had finally come to fruition, and global trade was booming. The modern age seemed to be at hand. The growth of British manufacturing and commerce produced a generation of merchants and professionals who made up Britain's new middle classes. Compared to previous generations of English middle classes, the early 18th century bourgeoisie tended to be wealthier, worldlier, more literate, possessed of more leisure time, and more aware of the potential power that their money and social positions gave them. Like previous generations, they wanted to move up in the world and eventually join the ranks of the upper classes. But unlike previous generations, they had more resources and social opportunities to do so. These merchants and professionals had the means to become a class of consumers unlike any the British economy had seen before. And with their wealth and numbers, they could use their wallets to steer British fashion, leisure, and popular culture toward their own sensibilities. In many ways, the influence of these middle classes changed the face of British society, especially in the cities. Shopkeepers proliferated and stocked their establishment with manufactured and imported luxury goods that would have been unavailable to anyone but the aristocracy a generation or two earlier. Clothes, foods, cosmetics, home goods. Shopping became its own leisure activity, identified most closely with middle class women. As more work moved outside the home, the women who could afford to stay within the home increasingly used their household's money to turn their domestic space into a private, peaceful retreat from the world. At the same time, the portion of public space devoted to entertainment and leisure grew to accommodate the new money crowds. Shifting away from the decadence and libertinism of the Restoration, theaters and playwrights began catering to the more morally conservative values of the middle classes. As more coffee and tea were imported from Britain's colonial outposts, coffee houses became the most popular spots for middle-class men to socialize, exchange news, and talk business. Public buildings and spaces were renovated to offer more gathering places and activities for both men and women. Concerts, lectures, exhibits, public parks and gardens. And this culture of commerce influenced British literature in ways that went beyond the theaters. A more literate public with more disposable time and income meant a larger audience for printed materials, and the merchant and professional classes did a lot of reading in their spare time. Novels finally had a viable commercial audience in the early 18th century, when more people had the money to purchase books and the time and ability to read them. Some of the biggest growth in the literary industry occurred in the periodical sector. Merchants and businessmen were heavily reliant on timely news, and they played close attention to current events. Moreover, most members of the middle classes were interested in the latest fashions and social activities and gossip around town, and newspapers and magazines sprang up to meet this demand for pop culture news and commentary. Some periodicals, like The Tatler and The Spectator, went further by offering their audience a guide to gentility. These periodicals set themselves up as arbiters of good taste for readers who wanted to assume the refinement of the upper classes but weren't sure how to do that. And in the case of the Tatler and the Spectator, they served as cheerleaders for the culture of commerce in which their audience lived and worked. They portrayed trade as a noble vocation and merchants as the backbone of the nation. Not everyone was enamored with the commercial classes or the consumerism that had taken over so much of British life and culture. The social mobility that the middle classes enjoyed led more traditional social critics to worry that people no longer knew their place, especially when it came to women. If people of means could deck themselves out and masquerade as gentlemen or ladies, what meaning did social class have? How do you know who a person really is or where they come from? Other critics of commerce worried that 
consumption and trade were destroying the British landscape and character? How long could cities sustain the mess and pollution of overcrowding and manufacturing? How could British morals survive the materialism of their modern society? Much of the period's literature dealt with these social anxieties as well, which would only increase as the cost of capitalism and empire came due back at home. Thank you for watching, and please review the video on restoration drama for this week as well.